Welcome to lecture two of um, CS110. In today's topic, we're looking at computer system hardware. Lecture one focused on the introductory aspect of CS110, where we discussed the history of computers. We looked at the input process output concept, and we looked at the various characteristics of a computer. So today we go a little further and appreciate the computers even more. So today of particular importance, we are looking at the computer system hardware. Okay, so in lecture one, we defined what hardware is. And we said in, in a layman's language, hardware is basically what we can see and touch or rather the physical aspects of a computer. Okay, so today we are looking at uh, the main components of the computer. Okay, so the computer consists of three main components. So one, which is the input output unit. We have the central processing unit, and then we have the memory unit. So these three units are of paramount importance when it comes to a computer. They are what makes up a computer. So they are so important, okay? So input output unit so basically if you if you remember what we looked at in the input uh, process output component um, concept you discover that with the input we basically we're looking at the aspects that have to do with uh, inputting data into the computer and then the output basically in charge of um, conveying the the output uh, results Okay, so when we're looking at the input output unit, we are looking at uh, the, the, the units responsible for the interaction of the computer. Okay, so in order for us to be able to interact with the computer, we need the input output unit. Okay, so without these, I don't know how the user experience is actually going to be. And then we have the central processing unit, okay, which is like the brain of the computer. Okay, so just like human beings, okay, we are composed of a brain so in order for us to be able to process information we actually need the brain so just like the computer so the cpu is actually responsible for processing of information then we have the memory unit at the end of the day once processing is done we need some form of storage so memory comes in to help us in that particular aspect so we are going to look at these three um, individual components in detail so the computer user interacts with the computer via the input and output unit. So right now I'm able to display this content right now because of the facilities of the input and output. Okay, so all this is being made easy for me because of the keyboard. Okay, because of the monitor. Okay, so this is of paramount importance to the computer. And then the purpose of the input output unit is to provide data and instructions as input to the computer and to present relevant information as output from the computer. Okay, simple, not so. Okay. And then uh, the CPU controls the operations of the computer and processes received input to generate the relevant output. So once the input inputs once the input unit inputs data into the computer so the central uh, processing unit is actually in charge of controlling the operations and processes okay that are received from the input end okay in order for us to have relevant output generated so the memory unit stores the instructions and data during input activity to make instructions readily available to the CPU during processing. So it stores, it also stores the processed output. So remember last time in lecture one, I said during the processing stage, there's also some form of storage that happens, okay? And I, in particular, mentioned the registers. So in this topic, in this lecture, we are going to also understand what registers are. So the central processing unit. So like I said earlier, it's like the brain of a computer. Okay, so this is a very important component in a, in a, um, a computer. So it actually has um, three parts. Okay, so we have the control unit, we have the arithmetic logic unit, and then we also have the registers. 
Okay, so these are what make up the central processing unit. Of course, also we need some form of storage. Okay, though it's not being explicitly shown in the representation on the screen. Okay, so the central processing unit or the processor is often called the brain of a computer. And the CPU consists of the ALU, arithmetic logic unit, and the central unit, the control unit rather. So in addition, the CPU also has a set of registers, like I mentioned earlier, which are temporal storage areas for holding data and instruction. So these are actually uh, uh, forms of storage that come in handy uh, during temporal storage when we are performing processing of data and instructions. So the central processing unit uh, continues and um, the ALU, um, which is a component of the central processing unit, performs the arithmetic and logic operations on the data that is made available to it. So the arithmetic logic unit, as the name suggests, arithmetic logic. Okay, so this one is important when it comes to arithmetic and logic operations. Okay, for as long as there's some form of arithmetic and logic operations, that data is availed to the ALU. Okay, and then we have the control unit, which is like a supervisor. Okay, it's responsible for organizing and processing of data and instructions. Okay, so this one acts like a supervisor. So this one is the one in charge of organization of what has to be processed and which instruction has to be processed next and so on. So it also coordinates the activities of other units of the computer. So like I said, it's like a supervisor, okay? So then the CPU also uses the registers to store the data instructions during processing. Okay, so in detail, uh, the arithmetic logic unit also has two units. So the arithmetic logic unit of the central processing unit has two units. So we have the arithmetic unit and the logic unit, okay? So remember the name is arithmetic logic unit. So we break it down into two, arithmetic and logic unit. So the arithmetic unit performs arithmetic operations on the data that is made available to it, okay? And some of the notable uh, operations are addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So the moment a computer is availed with these operations, or rather when it is signified of the fact that there are certain operations that have to be performed to do with arithmetic, okay, so the unit in charge of this within a computer is the arithmetic logic unit of the central processing unit, okay? And then the other one is the logic unit. Okay, which is responsible for performing logic operations. So comparison of numbers, for example, letters and special characters. So these happen under the logic unit of the arithmetic logic unit. If you want to compare numbers greater than, less than, or equal to, these conditions are performed under the logic unit. Okay, so ALU performs arithmetic and logic operations and uses registers to hold the data that is being processed. Okay, so for all the operations that happen in this unit, okay, we have some temporal storage units, okay, known as registers that actually are in charge of this particular um, processes. And then also as we go on, you understand that uh, registers are actually a general term, but then there are different types of registers for specific purposes within the central processing unit. Okay, so now registers. Okay, so registers are high speed storage areas. Okay, so within the CPU, but have the least storage capacity. Okay, obviously for certain re obvious reasons rather, okay. Why should they hold so much space when we all know storage in here is a stamper? Okay, and then at the end of the day, that data again is transferred to other storage units. So registers are not referenced by their address, okay, but are directly accessed and manipulated by the CPU during instruction execution. Okay. And then registers store data, they can store instructions addresses and intermediate results of processing. 
Okay, so registers are often referred to as the CPU's working memory, okay, because they are often used. Okay, for as long as there's some processing going on, registers are accessed. Registers are in use. No wonder they are referred to as the working memory. So registers are used for different purposes. So with each register serving a particular purpose, like I had alluded to earlier. So registers are in different um of different purposes okay so depending on the purpose that register will be called accordingly okay so some of the important registers in the cpu are as follows we have the accumulator the scc which stores the result of arithmetic and logic operations so remember we talked about the arithmetic logic unit that is in charge of any arithmetic operations as well as some logic okay so and in there we said there are two there's the, the there's the logic unit and then there's also the arithmetic unit okay so one is in charge of those arithmetic operations and then the other one logic okay so during processing of those particular um arithmetic operations so we have a special register called an accumulator the scc it's the one that stores intermediate results over processing in the ALU. And then we have the instruction register, IRA. It contains the current instruction most recently fetched. So not the word layer most recently fetched. Okay, so there are many instructions available on the computer, but then the instruction register, okay, holds the current instruction most recently fetched. Okay. And then we have the program counter PC, okay, which contains the address of the next instruction to be processed, okay? So we could think of a program counter as an address book, okay? So for example, in real life, we all come from different homes, okay? And our homes actually um, recognized by the various addresses that they have, okay? So each house is uniquely identified by its particular address, okay? So just like uh, the computer here, okay? So instructions actually hold uh, and rather recognized by their various addresses, okay? So now the program counter actually contains the address of the next instruction to be processed, okay? So it's like a queue. Okay, so you know this address is for this particular instruction and hence it has to be processed. Okay, so it keeps information in that particular manner. Okay, so those are some of uh, the registers that are available. Of course, there are more. Then we have the memory address register, the MAR, which contains the address of the next location memory to be accessed. Okay, because you know, or maybe in case you do not know, in memory, okay, we have what we call addresses. Okay, so again, this one can also be looked at like uh, an address book. Okay, so it keeps information about addresses of various memory locations. Then we have the memory buffer register, MBR, temporal story, uh, temporal. So, so uh, temporal, it stores data from memory or the data to be sent to memory. And then we have DR, the data register, which stores the operands and any other data. Okay, so those are some of uh, the various uh, memory registers that are available, okay, for different specific purposes. And then we have the control unit, okay? So the control unit of the computer does not do the, any actual processing of data. So like I said earlier, this one is like a supervisor. Okay, it delegates, you do that, you do this, you're supposed to go there, you're supposed to come back, you're supposed to do that. So it only delegates and doesn't do any form of processing. So it organizes the processing of data and instructions. Okay, and then it also acts as a, as a supervisor and controls and coordinates the activities of other units of a, of a computer. That's what this guy um, is used for. So this one is particularly used for delegation, okay? And then the control unit also coordinates the input and output devices of the computer. 
It directs the computer to carry out stored program instructions by communicating with the ALU and um, the registers. It can also tell when to fetch the data and instructions, what to do, where to store the results, the sequencing of events during processing. Okay, so this is the coordinator. Okay, this is the coordinator. Okay, and then the memory unit. Okay, so this consists of uh, cache memory and primary memory. Okay, so the primary memory sometimes referred to as main memory. So just in case you get confused, okay, so oftentimes primary memory can also, it's also uh, meant uh, for main memory and main memory the other way around for primary memory. So they are one and the same thing, just the names. So whenever you, whenever you see primary memory, just know that you're talking about main memory. And whenever you see main memory, just know that you are talking about primary memory. So these are, the, so primary memory, or main memory of a computer is used to store the data and instructions during execution of uh, the instructions. Okay, so um, we have what we call the random access memory, okay, and the read only memory, okay, which are the primary memory. So RAM and ROM are primary memory, but then they serve different purposes. Okay, so in addition to the main memory, there is another kind of storage known as a secondary storage. So we'll get to understand this uh, later. Okay, so the RAM, the ROM, they are coming from primary memory. And then uh, we have another one away from the main memory called the secondary memory. So we'll get to understand these later. Okay, so when you're looking at cache memory, basically cache memory is a very high speed memory placed in between the RAM and the CPU, okay? So cache, cache, cache memory um, is mainly used to increase the speed of processing, okay? In order for the computer to perform its processing faster than the way it does, okay? It needs to be boosted in terms of the speed, okay? And that boost actually comes from the cache memory, okay? So like we said, it increases the speed of processing, okay? So the cache memory is a storage buffer also, okay, that stores the data that is used more often, temporal, and makes them available to the CPU at a fast rate. Okay, there are certain, um, or rather, there's certain data that is frequently accessed, okay, uh, than any other data. Okay, and then because of its frequency in terms of being accessed, it requires some form of storage that is very fast in terms of processing, and so cache comes in handy. Okay, to actually do that. So cache memory is um, built into the processor and may also be located next to a separate chip between the CPU and the RAM. Okay, and then it's been built in levels, cache level one and then cache level two as well. So like we can see in this uh, representation here. Okay. And then uh, on primary memory again, so we're saying this is the main memory of the computer, okay? So it is used to store data and instructions during the processing of data, like we said. So primary memory is a semiconductor memory, okay? And it is of two kinds, like we saw earlier. It has RAM and ROM. So if we've been hearing of RAM, 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 so it is actually a primary a kind of primary memory. And then if, if you've also ahead of ROM, it is also a kind of a primary memory. So random access memory and read-only memory serving different purposes. So RAM is volatile. So meaning it stores data when the computer is on. So for as long as the computer is on, like right now, I can perform whatever operations on my, on my PC and that data will be stored. Okay, for as long as the computer is on. Okay, so hence its volatility name. Okay, so the information stored in RAM gets erased when the computer is turned off. Okay, so for as long as the computer is on, once you save, your data will be saved. Okay, so when the computer gets off, it gets erased. Okay, so RAM provides temporal storage for data and distractions. Okay. And then on the other hand, ROM is non-volatile, okay, but it is a read-only memory, 
Okay, so it's permanent in nature and is used for storing standard processing programs and permanently that permanently reside in the computer. Okay, so ROM comes programmed by the manufacturer. Okay. And then uh, the secondary memory, this one is away from primary memory. Okay, it stores data and instructions permanently. Okay, the information can be stored in secondary memory for a long time, years. Okay, and generally permanent in nature unless erased by the user themselves. And this one is also falling in the category of non-volatile because even if we switch off data, uh, even if we switch off the computer, disconnect whatever, data will be saved. Okay, because this one stores permanently. So you could think of this, for example, an external hard drive. Okay, so we can store information in the DVDs okay so dvds can only get compromised if they get scratched but for as long as they are not scratched you will be able to access the information okay for so many years and you can only delete information there as you want okay so that is the beauty about the secondary storage flash disk okay they also fall in this category because they are non-volatile and you can keep information for so many years for as long as you want okay so it also provides backup storage for data and instructions, okay? And then also the hard disk drive and optical disk drives are some of the examples of these storage devices and some of them, I actually mentioned them already, flash disk, okay, and others. Okay. And then uh, the data and instructions that are currently not being used by CPU okay, but maybe required later for processing also stored on the secondary storage memory, okay, they can be stored there, okay, it also has high storage capacity than the primary memory, okay, because of its permanent uh, storage of data, okay, primary memory, we know it stores for temporal uh, purposes, but then the secondary, it is, okay, for permanent um, purposes, Okay, and then because it also stores huge volumes of data, okay, it requires high storage, okay? You see people putting uh, different movies, series, okay, on, on external hard drives, okay? So when you look at the current capacities of uh, the external hard drives on the market, you find that you'll find the one terabyte and so on, okay? So the higher the capacity, the more data you are likely to store there, okay? And then also, on the machine itself, a computer, you have a hard drive, okay? You could actually also partition it further, okay? In order for you to be able to reserve space for other information, just in case uh, the main space where we have an, an operating system crashes, okay? Your information will survive on the other partition. So it will serve as a, a backup. So you can still keep information there for longer period of time. So it's also a good practice to actually partition your um, hard drive space on your local machine, okay? For sole purposes of keeping information as a backup plan. So that is the secondary memory. Okay, and then now we move on to something interesting, okay, the instruction cycle. So remember we said the CPU processes information, okay? This information, okay, can also be referred to as uh, the instructions, okay? So the primary responsibility of the computer is to, is to execute a sequence of instructions that constitute a program, okay? So the CPU executes each instruction in a series of steps called instruction cycles, okay? So the computer doesn't just do things randomly, okay? Randomly, no, but then there is what we call an instruction cycle. Okay, so how does it work? So we have the fetch aspect, we have the decode, execute and store. So cycle because it is a continuous process. Okay, like we can see in the diagram there. Okay, so the instruction cycle fetching. Okay, so um, an instruction cycle involves four steps. Like we have seen, huh? we have the fetch, okay. We have decode, execute, and store, okay? This here is what composes the instruction cycle, 
Okay, so one of the first aspects of the instruction cycle is fetching. So the, fe the, the processor fetches the instruction from the memory. Okay, so the fetched instruction is placed in the instruction register. Remember the different types of registers for different purposes. Huh? So we had the IR instruction register. Okay, that one of um, particular importance has to do with uh, the most recently fetched instruction. Okay, so the first, the, the, the fetched instruction is placed in the instruction register. Okay, and then the program counter then holds the address of the next instruction to be fetched and is incremented after each fetch. Okay, to show how these instructions are actually moving. So the fetching is the first step. Okay, you get the instruction from memory. Okay, so remember memory keeps uh, instructions, okay, during processing or even after. Okay, so that is mainly used for storage purposes. So whatever needs to be worked on, it has to be fetched from memory. So the fetched instruction is placed in the instruction register. Okay, the IR, and then we have a program counter now that will signify which next address of the next instruction that will be fetched. So we have an instruction in the instruction register, and then the program counter will tell us to say, okay, so right now in the IR, I this particular instruction. So once that one is done, the next one is this. Okay, that is how it works. Okay, so now we move to decoding. Okay, so the instruction that is fetched is broken down in two parts or decoded. Okay, so the instruction is translated into commands so that they correspond to those in the CPU's instruction set. Okay, so the instruction set architecture of the CPU defines the way in which an instruction is actually decoded. Okay, so how the instruction is decoded is actually up to the instruction set of the CPU. Okay. So when we fetch that instruction, it has to be decoded, okay, or rather broken down into smaller parts, okay, and then they are translated into commands that correspond to the CPU's instruction set, okay. And then after decoding, we execute, okay. So the execution, the the decoded instruction, or the command is executed. So the CPU performs the operation implied by the program instruction. For example, if it is an add instruction, addition is performed. Okay. Yeah. So the CPU performs implied uh, the operation implied by the program instruction. Okay. So if it receives an add instruction, then the addition will be performed. If it received the multiplication instruction from what has been decoded, then that will be performed. So already an addition will be done from the arithmetic logic unit, okay? Then lastly, you have to store, of course, okay? Storing, so CPU writes back the results of execution to the computer's memory. So from memory, we can get an instruction that has to be worked on. And then once we work on that particular instruction it's decoded and executed, it has to be stored back into memory, okay? So this is the instruction cycle here. So it's a cycle because it's ongoing, okay? So there's a fetch of an instruction from memory and then you place it in the IR and then uh, increment the PC, the program counter, okay? So remember the IR is holding the currently fetched instruction and then uh, the PC program counter is telling us to say once an instruction has been worked on in the IR, the next one is this particular one. So it gives us the address of the next instruction to be fetched. And then from there, we have decoding, okay, breaking down of instruction into smaller parts, okay, using the instruction set of the computer, the architecture. Okay, and then from there, an execution, okay. And then after that, storage of the instruction in the computer. And then uh, we fetch another instruction. So it's it's ongoing. So one, one particular instruction is done just like that. Okay. And then uh, um, there's what we call interconnection of the units of the computer. Remember, the computer is composed of different units. So how do they work together as a whole? Okay. So there is some form of interconnection. 
and the interconnection is made possible by what we commonly call a bus. Okay, so let's give a typical example of the real world life today. Okay, let's give an example of Copper Belt. So Copper Belt is a province, okay, and then it has different towns within it. So in order for me to move from Kitwe to Luansha, I'll need an interconnection. Okay, there's a road that will lead me back to Luansha. And then that is made possible through a bus or any other form of transport. Okay, in that way, we are able to interconnect. I can move from Luansha to Ndola through the road channel. That is an interconnection. I can go there using any form of transport and commonly people use buses. Okay, so the interconnection of the units in the computer is made possible by the bus. So a bus is a set of electronic signal paths, rather pathways that allow information and signals to travel between the components inside or outside of the computer. So the bus in a computer are just basically an electronic signal pathway. It's a pathway, it's like a road, okay? That allows for signals to travel to and from, okay? Between different components inside the computer, okay? So the different components of the computer, remember we said the CPU, the input unit, the memory unit, okay? Are connected with each other by the bus. Okay, by the bus. So a computer bus can be divided into two types. We have the internal bus and the external bus. Okay, so we say the computer bus can be divided into two types, an internal bus and an external bus. So the internal bus connects components inside the motherboard, like CPU and the system memory. Okay. So the internal bus connects components inside the motherboard, okay? Like the CPU and the system memory. And then it is also called the system bus, okay? Sometimes an internal bus is called the system bus because its sole responsibility is to interconnect components inside the motherboard, such as the CPU and the system memory. On the other hand, the external bus connects the different external devices, okay, such as the peripherals, expansion slots, input, output ports, and drive connections to the rest of the computer. So all connections done outside, we use the external bus, okay, the keyboard, the mouse, and so on, and other peripherals, expansion slots, okay, when you put... Um, a flash disk on the slots there, what happens? Okay, so the connection there is enabled by the external bus. And then anything to do with interaction within the computer inside, okay? We have the internal bus or rather the system bus. Okay, so the system bus or the internal bus. So the functions of uh, the data bus, the address bus and control bus. Okay, so in the system bus are uh, as follows. So in a system bus, we have data bus, we have address bus and the control bus. Okay, let's get that one clearly. So we said there are two main buses. There's a system or internal bus, and then we have an external bus. So the internal bus or system bus is mainly used to interconnect connections within the confinements of uh, the CPU and other system memory. And then now we are saying within the system bus, there are three types of buses. There's a data bus, there's address bus, and the control bus. So what do they do? So the data bus transfers data from the CPU and the memory. So it's between the CPU and memory. We have a data bus. It transfers the data, okay? It transfers the, uh, the, the data, so it's like a bus specifically for a particular route between the CPU and the memory. So we can have a bus specifically for Luansha and Kitu. So to and from, okay? And then we have address bus that connects the CPU and RAM with set of wires similar to the data bus. So this one is between the CPU and the RAM. Okay, RAM, we know it's memory 
Okay, but then here we're talking about the address bus. So meaning in uh, our storage there, you've got different what? Locations. Okay, and so the address bus connects the CPU and the RAM to be able to know which particular information to actually access at what particular address. Okay, and then we have the control bus specifies whether data is to be read or written to the memory. So remember control, control unit. Okay, we say that one specifically does what? Delegation. So when it comes to the control bus here, this one now specifies whether data has to be read or control, or rather written to the memory. So it's given, given uh, a directive, okay? Whether to write the data or to read the data to memory. So in the system bus, we have control bus, address bus, and the data bus. Data bus to know the data to transfer between the CPU and the memory rather to transfer data between CPU and memory address bus connecting the CPU and the RAM. Control bus to specify or rather let us know whether the data has to be read or written to memory and so on. So this is a depiction of a system bus. So we have the CPU and memory. Okay, so here is our system bus. On our far right, we have the data bus, the address bus and the control bus. Okay, so this is showing us a depiction of the different buses that we were talking about in line with the system bus. Okay, so the lines we are seeing there, okay, are like channels. Okay, so this is basically what happens. So memory is accessed by the control bus, it's also accessed by the address bus, and then also by the data bus. Okay, so and so on and uh, so forth. Okay. So the data bus goes to the CPU. Okay, the address bus goes to the CPU and the control bus as well. Okay, so depending on what they want to do in those particular areas. Okay, and then we also have expansion bus. So the expansion bus connects external devices to the rest of the computer, okay? So the external devices like the monitor, keyboard, and printer connect to ports on the back of the computer, okay? So again, there depends on uh, the design of the computer. Some is not really at the back, some is on the sides, okay? And then we have uh, external ports. Okay, so the peripheral devices interact with the CPU of the computer via the bus. So the connections to the bus from the peripheral devices are made via the ports, okay, and sockets provided at the sides of the computer. So we, we normally see them. So in your spare time, you can actually check them out, okay, the various ports that are available, okay? So the performance of a computer, as we can see there. Okay, so we have the processor okay running on uh that has a uh, in between the processor there we have cache between the ram and the processor itself so in, on different levels level one and level two okay so the registers um the registers there okay so the size of the register rather the word size okay indicates the amount of data with which the computer can work at any given time, okay? So the bigger the size, the more quickly it can process data, okay? So a 32-bit CPU is one in which each register is 32 words bit wide, okay? So word size is also referred to as a register, in case we did not know, okay? So there are different um, bit sizes, okay? of these CPUs, so there's a 32-bit, we also hear of a 64-bit, so we are simply referring to the word size, okay, of the computer, okay, so a 32-bit CPU, we are saying is one in which each register is 32 bits wide, okay, in terms of the size, and then uh, the RAM uh, is used to store data and instructions during execution of uh, instructions. So anything you do on your computer requires a RAM, actually. 
okay? So if RAM is less, then the CPU waits each time the new information is swapped into memory from the slower devices. Okay, so PCs nowadays usually have a 1 GB to 4 GB of RAM. Okay, some in fact even have 8 GB of RAM. Okay, so remember we're talking about evolution of computers here, advancements. Okay, so they're actually even bigger sizes. Okay, it's not just about one and two or, th or four. Okay, there's even eight. Okay. So, and then also we have a system clock when you're looking at performance of a computer. Okay, so the clock speed of a CPU is defined as a frequency with which a processor executes instructions or the data that is processed. So the higher clock frequencies mean more clock ticks per second. Okay, so the clock frequency is measured in millions of cycles per second or megahertz or gigahertz, which is billions of cycles per second. Okay. Okay, and then uh, the bus still. So we're saying the data bus is used for transferring data between the CPU and the memory. So the data bus width affects the speed of the computer. Okay, so in a 16 bit processor, 16 bit wire bus can carry 16 bits of data. That's what it means. Okay, but the bus speed is measured in megahertz. So higher the bus speed, the better it is. Okay, and then uh, we also look at the cache memory there. So two of the main factors that affect the cache's performance are its size as well, amount of cache memory, and the levels one, two, three, and so on. So the larger the size of cache, the better it is at processing. Okay, so PCs as a 2010 had um, a level one cache of 256 kilobytes and level two cache of one MB. So you need to do a research find out where we are currently. Okay, I'm sure we are actually even better. Okay, and then also uh, the processor speed, the RAM size, the hard disk size uh, are very important actually when you are looking at uh, the specs of the computer. So what processor speed, RAM size, hard disk size would you recommend for a desktop computer to have Reasonable, uh, reasonable performance. So you do a research on your own and you should be able to answer this question here. Every time you're buying a computer, you always ask, what's the processor speed? What's the RAM size? What's the hard disk space? Okay, so now this is your task as we are looking at performance of the computer. Okay, find out what processor speed, what RAM size, the hard disk size would you recommend for a desktop computer? to have a reasonable performance. Remember here the keyword is desktop computer, not laptop, okay? So find out this information here. Okay, so this is a self-study for you. Okay, so inside the computer cabinet. So this is a cabinet of a desktop computer. Okay, you should be able to uh, check it out. Okay, of course we can see the motherboard there, this memory. There are some expansion slots, okay? There's a fan, the processor, power supply, the CD-ROM, okay, the power cables, we have the floppy drive, okay, we have the data cable, and then they have, we have the hard disk drive, okay? So those of you that have opportunities to see some of these things, you can actually check them out. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we are actually unable to do this. Okay, it was going to be interesting if we did this together in class. Okay, so for now, it is your individual research. So you can actually look this up as well. Okay, so this is a motherboard. You can check out what it is uh, composed of. Okay. Yeah. So all these expansion slots, you can check them out. Okay, the mouse connector, the parallel port. Okay and those other items. So this has been uh, lecture two. And as usual, if you have any questions, please do note them down. And when we have an opportunity to meet physically in class, you can ask the burning questions. And if everything is okay, then we are good to go. From me, Mrs. Banda, good day. Thank you.